Hi, I'm Max Kaiser, and this is the Kaiser Report. You probably haven't thought much about eating plastic chickens, eating plastic eggs, or chowing down on some plastic rice. And we're going to be talking about that shortly, but first, let's bring in Stacey Herbert. <laughs> Max Kaiser. Hello. Hello. Hey, you know what? The biggest story, of course, is this revolution sweeping the world. Revolutions, the one in Egypt, of course, everybody's looking for the cause. Is it inflation and the inflation of food prices? Is it the rising um, inequality reflected in the Gini coefficient index? Here's some reasons that I'm going to look at. First headline, Tony Blair. Mubarak is, quote, immensely courageous and a force for good. What? <laughs> yes, he actually said this on the Piers Morgan show. We're not going to actually listen to his words because I just can't stand listening to him. But I'm going to say what I think he was actually saying. Mubarak is immensely courageous for looting so much money from his people so openly and brazenly and a force for good kickbacks. Mubarak, Obama, uh, Tony Blair, they're good. Uh, if there's a revolution, great. We'll send in the uh, Vodafone and the Starbucks. No revolution? Great. We'll send in some bombers and some tear gas canisters. We make money no matter what happens because we're arbitrageurs, not politicians. But the other important thing about this is this class of global kleptocrats, of globally connected elite who plunder their own countries together. And this brings me to this next story. Egypt's Mubarak likely to retain vast wealth. Mubarak family may have as much as $70 billion stashed away. Amani Jamal, who is a professor at Princeton, said that Mubarak's assets are most likely in banks outside of Egypt, possibly in the United Kingdom and Switzerland. Mubarak, his wife and two sons were able to also accumulate wealth through a number of business partnerships with foreigners. Right, well, the kleptocrats that plunder together, stay together. You know, this is the global kleptocratic class, and they are all working together. They're colluding, as Adam Smith pointed out, in any situation where capitalism is the prevailing economic model, you have naturally a t propensity toward collusion, and that's why you need very stiff regulations to try to keep these guys from fixing prices, but all the regulations are not. Now, in the uh, two, mid-2000s, a lot of the regulations were taken away in Egypt. It was deregulated, and this is when the wealth and income gap just skyrocketed, and it's also why uh, the central banks and their money printing to feed the pockets of the kleptocrats have caused these huge spike in food prices. So, uh, as, you, as you point out, it's a combination of the Gini coefficient, which measures the wealth and income gap around the world, plus the relative amount that is spent personal income on food. So in, in Egypt, much of the personal income goes to food, plus you have the Gini coefficient exploding equals revolution. So if you want to handicap which countries are next to pop, that's the way you do it. Well, I have a headline here, Max. If inequality is a factor for Egypt, dot, dot, dot. If you take a look at that little chart, this is a Gini coefficient index, which zero is perfect equality. Everybody has exactly the equal amount. 100 is only one person owns all of the wealth of the nation. So the closer to 100 you are, the higher the number, the more unequal it is. Pakistan is 30.6, Egypt 34, Israel 39.2, Tunisia 40, and the U.S. 45. Yeah, the U.S. is very high on that list, which would portend insurrection and regime change. But the thing that keeps it from happening is that percentage of income toward food is still low because of the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency. So food and energy are still relatively low. This is what is keeping the wave of global insurrection at bay in a country like the U.S., but it will get there. And when it does get there, it'll be 360 degrees of global insurrection against banker occupation. And then we can hope to see a complete total global regime change of all the corrupt bankers, including Blythe Masters over there at J.P. Morgan, who we'll be talking about at length in the second half. So don't go away. But, 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 but tell us <laughs> we more. Saw, I saw tell us more. more. Tell us more. Sense. Tell us more. Okay. We're talking about the global insurrection against banker occupation. Part of the things that bankers have done is create volatility in the major agricultural products and inflation. Here the headline reads, not since reconstruction have we seen cotton this high. Yeah, well, that's right. The price of cotton is skyrocketing. It's at a 150-year high. Not since the Civil War and reconstruction and the carpetbaggers. 
famous down there in the south of America? Has cotton been so high? And as I've been saying on this show, Stacey Herbert, before long, the number one employer occupation in America will be cotton picking. And they're going to, of course, sing those old spirituals like jump down, turn around, pick a bag of cotton and others. Well, another part of the reason is you see this um, inflation hitting China as well. China, Chinese take a cotton to hoarding. Apparently, farmers in China are hoarding their cotton up to 9% of the world's cotton supply. And the reason being that they are holding out for higher prices, even though they're at 150-year highs. They're aiming to help overcome higher costs of labor and fertilizer. The cost of fertilizer, for example, is up 20% in the last year. So they're not covering their costs, even with cotton at 150-year highs. Right. Well, fertilizer, of course, is, uh, is, a, is a chemical petroleum-based product. And a price of oil is skyrocketing as well. It's important to keep in mind that the reason these prices are skyrocketing is not because of increased demand on the side of the user. It's not because suddenly there's a demand for food and oil. The reason the prices are going high is the supply of cheap money that was thrown into the system after the credit crash of the 2007-2008 period. And the banks on Wall Street told the Federal Reserve, we need money to pay our, our yacht payments. And we can't get it because the system is frozen. Can you please give us $2 trillion? And Ben Bernanke said, okay, here's $2 trillion so the bankers on Wall Street could pay their yacht payments. But it had the perverse effect of feeding speculation in agricultural commodities and cotton to the point where it's starving people in these countries. So once again, to give you the formulation, Wall Street bankers fed starving people. Fed gives the money to the bankers who make their yacht payments, but it has the perverse effect of starving people around the world. So Wall Street bankers are starving people, like uh, Jamie Dimon is committing murder. He's killing people. <laughs> so the starving people are not fed because of the Fed. <laughs> That's right. The Fed is causing people not to be fed. <laughs> um, well, we've always talked about how inflation it helps the rich because, of course, they own the assets into which a lot of the um, money goes, but also they get money for 0% from the Fed and then are able to speculate on all, all sorts of products. Th just to quickly, think of it as a river. You know, the river flows down. So the, the Fed creates a flow of cash, and the people that toward, live near the Fed, like on Wall Street, that they get the fresh water, the clean water, and if you live downstream, you get the dirty water, and that's the, what happens in the global financial market. And it increases the price of agricultural products, i.e. food. And we see that related to these headlines, these coming up, these, just these charts, actually, to show you what the difference between the revolutions happening in the Middle East and why no revolution has yet happened in Asia. So if you take a look at this wheat chart, you'll see it's uh, rocketing. And then take a look at the rice chart. You'll see that that's not gone up nearly as much. So because rice has not gone up, the main staple of the peasant in Asia, you're not seeing as much, perhaps, yet strife. Right, but the whole commodity complex is moving higher due to this incredible influx of money that's been directed by the bankers for the bankers at the exclusion of the rest of the global population. They're willing to commit mass genocide of the global population by increasing food prices to the extent of causing starvation just to keep that multi-hundred billion dollar bonus peel, pool active on Wall Street. That's the only reason this is happening. Those people are culpable in a mass homicide, mass genocide. Well, just to show you another reason why perhaps rice isn't increasing as much, here's the headline for you, Max. China makes fake rice from plastic? Vietnam reacts. So apparently, according to a Korean language weekly Hong Kong newspaper, China is mass producing fake rice. This rice is a mix of potatoes, sweet potatoes, and plastic. It is formed by mixing the potatoes and sweet potatoes into the shape of rice grains, then adding industrial synthetic resins. Apparently, experts are advising that the synthetic resins can be very harmful if consumed. And a Chinese Restaurant Association official said that eating three bowls of this fake rice would be like eating one plastic bag. Yes, it's like eating, uh, you know, plastic. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, oh, that's not a That's not a flow. That's not a Yes, that's delicious. It's completely fake rice. Of course, in China now, they have the added 
um, situation, I guess you could call it, of McDonald's is half of their restaurants now going forward will be these drive through restaurants. So uh, presumably you'll be going through a drive through restaurant in some highway in the middle of a ghost city in China ordering a Big Mac made out of plastic rice and trying to drink a hot But Max, I might yeah. also point out that fake stimulus, fake money printing, fake GDP growth, fake goods and services being produced is t causing us, forcing us to consume fake food. It's fiat food. Because we can't afford real food, because we have no real growth, we have no real economy, we have no real industry. We only have fake stuff. I so it. it makes sense that we're only eating fake food. Fake food, right. So you have fake fiat currencies yeah. and it's causing fake food because the real food now is too expensive. Nobody can afford the real food because they're making fake food. And so final headline here, Max, Iceland proves Ireland did wrong things sacrificing taxpayers. <laughs> Okay, this is from Bloomberg. Apparently, unlike other nations, including the U.S. and Ireland, which injected billions of dollars of capital into their financial institutions to keep them afloat, Iceland placed its biggest lenders in receivership. It chose not to protect creditors of the country's banks, whose assets had ballooned to $209 billion, 11 times gross domestic product. And the Icelandic economy this year is projected to grow 3%. Bloomberg says... Iceland's decision to let the banks fail is looking smart and may prove to be a model for others. Absolutely. That's what we've been saying on the show. Michael Hudson, Dr. Michael Hudson, economist, has been advising countries uh, to close their banks and default on the loans. But I might add, Max, actually for 150 years since cotton was at a last all-time high, we have known that if you let the failures fail and you don't rescue them. This is the heart of what capitalism is supposed to be, not rescue and bail out the crony capitalists, the neoliberal crony capitalists. Yeah, well, that would be capitalism. But we don't want to talk about capitalism. Only in Iceland do you find capitalism. Exactly, but it's not a new model. It's an old, old model. And Bloomberg is talking about it as if it is a new model. That, right. wow, we're shocked. How is this happening? Wow, maybe we should all study this. But it, there are thousands of books about this. Do You could study them. You could have looked at that. Right. So the idea of uh, free market capitalism and competition has been has so horribly diluted and ignored during this crisis that the idea of actually having a company or a bank fail is considered new by Bloomberg. <laughs> this is a new idea. Yes. It's called capitalism. It's something brand new. It's crazy, kids. <laughs> <laughs> you, you compete, and if you don't win, you know, you got to be shuffled off and let somebody else try. Wow, what a concept. I wonder if that'll catch on. Well, in Iceland, maybe. <laughs> I think it'll catch on before uh, Plastic Rice does. Okay, Stacy, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right.